Hi, everybody. Welcome to your video lecture on argumentation, appeals, and logical fallacies. Now, some of the beginning of this presentation I may have gotten to in class because I'm going to be uh, introducing the, the concept of argumentation and, and we'll have some some visual representations and uh, and we'll be we'll be looking at a few things there in class uh, so the beginning may be a little bit of review but that's okay uh, keep watching we will get into some of the more complicated stuff the logical fallacies as it goes on now uh, if you are in my online or hybrid classes then this is a required part of your online instruction hours uh, and in order to get credit for having watched and and uh, watched this video all the way through you know make sure you're watching the video taking notes since I won't be able to talk about it in class and uh, you'll be taking down the secret password that I will give at one point in the uh, the video I will stop the video or I, I will stop the presentation in order to give you your secret password uh, just like before uh, so we are going to be I'm going to shrink myself as I've done before and start our presentation on argumentation let me just do this Here we go. All right, so argumentation, uh, the idea of an argument. Uh, when you think of an argument, you might think about people fighting. You might think about people screaming at each other. Uh, argument, when thought of in that way, like a fight, like, an, like people in a shouting match, there's nothing logical about those kinds of arguments. Arguments like that, people will say whatever they can in order to hurt someone else or in order to seem right, even if it's not uh, a logical point that they're making. Sometimes they will even say things that are false in order to win a fight. Uh, you see this all the time when people get in those, uh, those kind of flame wars online where they're, where they're posting things back and forth, and they're not really listening to each other. They're not really trying to resolve anything in a fight like that. Uh, they're really just waiting for the other person to stop speaking or waiting for the other person to post something again online because then they're really going to lay into them with the next thing that they say. Uh, a lot of times if you get into arguments like that with people like fights, you, you're, you are just waiting for them to stop talking and you're not really listening to them. Uh, and you have something prepared. So a lot of times you get into a fight like that and you might even forget what it's about. Like it starts about one thing, then after a while it, it, it gets really personal and you can't even remember how it started or what it was about in the first place because it's not a logical thing. When we're talking about argumentation in your, in your essays, uh, in an English class, uh, it has to do with logic uh, and it has to do with an academic situation in which you are trying to prove something so an argument when we're talking about it it's more like the arguments that a lawyer makes uh they have closing arguments they have opening arguments right they're made to an impartial audience which would be either the judge or the jury right and they are trying to make a point and in that case it's usually they're trying to prove something about uh, the defendant in the case, uh, prove them innocent, prove them guilty, things like that. They present evidence, right, in order to make their point. And this is the same thing that you should be doing. You are not uh, stating things that can't be proven. You are not uh, making claims without proof. You are not just attacking someone uh, on the basis of something that has nothing to do with the point you're trying to make. You are trying to make a point by presenting evidence for that point, right? So there are three kinds of appeals to an audience. I say three types of evidence here in this slide, but really what I'm talking about is the way you appeal to your audience. Think of yourself like that lawyer. How are you appealing to the jury? Uh, the, the three different kinds of uh, appeals or, or evidence you might give, it might be logical evidence. It might have to do it, it's, it, it may be evidence that appeals to the jury, the audience, your readers. It may appeal to them based on their sense of logic and reasoning. 
it may appeal to them based on their sense of ethics. I'm going to talk more about that. I'm not going to go in this order, actually. Uh, it may appeal to them on an emotional level. So logic first, there's an old Greek term for this, and some of you may be familiar with it, logos. Uh, an argument can be supported by logos or logical evidence. That's when you are presenting facts that help to support the claim you're making. That's when you're presenting statistics. Most of the times your facts are coming in the form of statistics that you're quoting or expert testimony that you are quoting. And you are, uh, it's, it's based on how reliable this, this testimony is. It's from an expert, so it can be trusted and it is logical as it, uh, it, since it can be trusted as reliable, then it helps you logically to make your point. And, and what the ex, whatever the expert says should be logical and, and reasonable and help to make your argument. Um, before we do that, I'm going to go back, uh, uh, instead of uh, uh, coming out of my little uh, my little s miniature screen here, uh, because that might be a sign to students who are just kind of skimming through the video, you are going to use the secret password logos in order to get credit for this assignment. The secret password is logos, uh, and I will give a false secret password as it goes on. So an argument can also appeal to your audience or to the uh, readers emotionally. So you might appeal to your audience's emotions based on things like fear or sympathy. Those are the most common emotions that get appealed to when you're talking about the, the appeal to the audience. Um, there are other things like patriotism you might, you might appeal to that. That's not really as recognizable as in emotion though uh, a lot of times like fear and sympathy those are the two big ones think about for example modern arguments on the debate of immigration this topic frequently relies on emotional appeals uh, those who are for stronger stricter immigration laws and consequences for immigrants illegal immigrants they they play on fear they say these immigrants are coming over here and they are criminals and they will commit crimes so you should be afraid so we should do this uh, or they say they these these uh, immigrants will come and they will take your job and so you should be afraid because you you will have less opportunities for work because of these immigrants right and they're playing on fear in order to gain support for their side which is for stronger immigration and the other side will play on sympathy sympathy for these immigrants these immigrants are uh, often refugees fleeing from danger in uh, uh, whatever country that they came from previously uh, so you should feel sympathy for them uh, you should feel sympathy when um, ICE uh, deports someone and separates their family. You should feel sympathy for these children that are, you know, being uh, interned at the border, uh, you know, children in cages that kind of uh, inspire sympathy. In fact, one of the most common emotional appeals is to think about children who are innocent and vulnerable, and you're going to feel sympathy for these children, especially if something bad could happen to these children. It's going to hit you on an, on an emotional level. Um, so that's the kind of thing that we talk about with emotions. You don't want to rely too much on an emotional appeal that uh, can actually sometimes seem like you are manipulating the emotions of the audience and you don't want it to seem like you are manipulating them and relying too much on, on, uh, on emotional appeals that are just trying to make them feel bad or make them feel fear. You want to also have some of that logical evidence, right? Proof that you can point to. Uh, otherwise, if it seems like you're being manipulative, manipulating emotions, then it affects you on the other level. The, the third one that I mentioned, which is on the ethical level. Now ethics or ethos, uh, the ethos is, uh, is, is the, uh, the appeal based on an arguable, arguer's credibility. Now, it's not about the, the, the reader's or the audience's ethics so much. It is, in a way, because they will judge your credibility as the person making the argument based on whether or not your argument seems like it's ethical. So if it matches their sense of ethics, would be, which would be their sense of right and wrong, their sense of what is fair and unfair. Uh, if you are 
making an argument, and even if you have lots of strong logical evidence for your argument, but what you're arguing for seems immoral or, or wrong or, or unfair, then you, you lose credibility with them. Uh, but if you seem to be on the side of right or you can present your argument so it seems like you are on the side that is right, which you should always be doing, uh, having some sort of moral center or ethical center to your argument, then, uh, then, then you might be able to get them on your side as someone that can, they can trust. And that's what ethos is all about, that they can trust you. And it's about your credibility. So if you are presenting sources that are unreliable sources uh, from, you know, just bad sources, they, they don't look good, um, they're biased sources, things like that, and you're presenting them like they are logos evidence, then that affects your credibility. Uh, because they, they might be able to see through that and see, oh, well, they're not really using strong sources here. Uh, they can also look at um, how you are appealing on an emotional level. If you are manipulating their emotions, they, they might start to, to lose uh, trust in you. And it's about being trustworthy as the person that is making the argument. You want to convince them, and you have to be credible and trustworthy in order to convince them, right? Uh, now, uh, if, if another student asks you what the secret password is to get credit for this, uh, you know, they need to watch the video themselves to, to find the secret password. So uh, you, can, you can tell them that the secret password is ethos. But we know that the secret password really is logos. Okay. So we have these three appeals that you can use. They work together. You never are just relying on, well, I use pathos in my argument by appealing to emotions. Well, you shouldn't just be using pathos because you also need some, some evidence, some logos down here, uh, some evidence, data, universal truths. You can't just rely on uh, the reader's prejudices or uh, their emotions because if you do, it might affect your credibility and whether they can trustworthy, trust you. Another thing that affects your credibility, not just your morals, as it says there, not just your sense of ethics in the argument you're making. My example for that is uh, Jonathan Swift, a famous writer. He wrote Gulliver's Travels. He also wrote a, uh, I think it's called a modest proposal or something like that, where he was making an argument for what should be done about the poor in London at the time. He said, we have these two problems. There are a lot of orphans on the street begging for money. There are a lot of poor people in poor houses that can't afford to eat and there's hunger. So, uh, clearly, yeah, he, he has logic on his side that these two problems can be solved. And he talks about how we can take care of all of the poor. Uh, we, we, can, we can get rid of all of the poor orphans on the street and we can take care of all the hunger issues if we just feed those orphans to the poor people. And he's talking about people eating children. And so, I mean, he's saying it in a joking way. It's satire. He's actually uh, not being serious and he's trying to prove a point. But the idea is, yeah, it, his argument has logic, but it is not moral. It is not ethical. And so it would never convince anyone. Everyone would say, well, yeah, I guess it, people who, people who would say, well, yeah, I guess that would feed the poor and get rid of the orphans. Those people are psychopaths or, or sociopaths, right? So <clears throat> you need something of, uh, of both. You need, uh, you need both, you need both a moral center and ethical center in your ethos. And you also need logic and uh, you should appeal on, a, on an emotional level uh, to some degree. But something else that can affect your ethos is your intelligence. If you show yourself to be like quoting a, something or talking about a source and it's pretty clear you don't know what you're talking about, uh, it's pretty clear that you don't really understand some part of your source or that you really didn't uh, have a good grasp of the reading that you're referring to, this affects your credibility. Uh, someone's not going to trust you if they're like, oh, uh, this person doesn't know what they're talking about. They said this, and that, you know, obviously that's misunderstanding the topic. So uh, all of these work together to make your argument 
useful and persuasive. And if you rely on just too much, if you rely on uh, emotional appeals too much, or or if you are a little bit uh, tricky uh, and less trustworthy in the evidence you present, or the evidence you present actually isn't logical, then sometimes you make a weak argument. And th these weak arguments, they rely on illogical evidence or premises, uh, what we call fallacies. <clears throat> it's related it's related to the idea of a falsehood, right? Something that's false. So I, as, uh, as the presentation goes on, I'm going to be talking about logical fallacies. <clears throat> the fallacies, and you can see that I, I, uh, I use this, this example of, it's a weak link in a chain. An argument, just like a coherent paragraph is a chain of thoughts, an argument is a chain of evidence. And if one of your pieces of evidence is weak like this, obviously that chain isn't going to hold and it's going to pull apart. So uh, the first fallacy we will talk about, and some of them will have funny Latin names like this, non sequitur. It means it does not follow. Non sequitur means... Uh, a sequitur comes from like the idea of a sequence. A non sequitur shows that it is not in a sequential order. And this has to do with the logic of your argument not really following uh, from a premise. Most arguments have what's called a premise. A premise leads to a conclusion, right? Sometimes you have two premises and then they lead to a conclusion. So, a non sequitur is an idea or a conclusion that does not follow logically based on the evidence or based on the premises that you have. Sometimes your evidence is true, your premises are true, but the conclusion you reach doesn't make sense. I've got some examples. So I read about a pit bull attack. That's true. Our neighbor owns a pit bull. That's also true. Therefore, my life is in danger. So it's like you're saying fact. Pit bulls sometimes attack people. Fact, my neighbor has a, a pit bull. Therefore, my neighbor's pit bull will attack people. That's not necessarily true, right? Look at this cute little pit bull. That's not the same as uh, the pit bull that attacks people. Not all pit bulls are the same. So you have reached a false conclusion, right? Your, ev your conclusion does not follow from the evidence. Uh, here's another example. Uh, all men die eventually. Right, that's true. All men are mortal. All canines are also mortal. Dogs will die. Therefore, all men are dogs. Does that follow? No, that doesn't make sense. Is an old Captain America? Is he a dog? No. I was gonna have a, a picture of some 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 guy who looked like a jerk here, but instead I used the the man with the dog's head. Men are not dogs, even in the sense that you uh, some people might say all men are dogs, like. Uh, you know, women will say that sometimes, uh, but that's metaphorical, right? Obviously, just because they both die doesn't mean they are the same species. Okay, so then we have uh, begging the question. So a lot of the logical fallacies will have a phrase like this, or we call this begging the question, or doing this, or uh, you know, it's it's like uh, the straw man, the the red herring, right? So each one has a little phrase or a Latin term, and you'll see that. So begging the question is when you base an argument on an assumption. So your argument is based on this assumption, and you have not proven your assumption. And, and sometimes you're just kind of restating your claim instead of proving the assumption that is underneath your claim. Now, a lot of times these can be similar. Like, for example, the non sequitur. There's some assumption at the basis there. Uh, for example, there's an assumption that all pit bulls have to be the same. One must be just like the other for me to reach my conclusion, right? But it's not quite the same. It's, it's about like skipping steps. Your evidence don't lead to the facts. Begging the question is more about um, instead of offering evidence and proving your assumption, you just kind of restate it in another way. Uh, so an example. Freedom of speech is important. Uh, oops. I got uh, something here. 
oh, I'm missing something from the slide, but that's okay. So freedom of speech is important. Here is your, your argument uh, there on that side of the screen. Freedom of speech is important because, and then you need to be proving it, but here I'm uh, underneath, I, I was putting that here's the assumption that's unproven that you are just kind of restating it, right? Uh, he, freedom of speech is important because people should be able to speak freely. Well, you're not saying really why freedom of speech is important. You're just kind of saying it is. You're kind of saying freedom of speech is important because freedom of speech is important. Instead of giving evidence, you are just kind of repeating yourself. Freedom of speech is important because speaking freely is important. Well, I mean, that's, that's not offering proof. You're just saying it again in a different way, right? So it begs the question. This is why it's called begging the question. The argument from that slide, it begs the question, how do, you, how do you know that it's better for people to speak freely? Uh, it's missing a word there too. I'll have to fix this. Uh, how do you know that it's better for people to speak freely? Well, you have to give some evidence. You, you can't just repeat it as your proof. You can't say it's good for people to speak freely because freedom of speech is important. Well, you know, give me some reasons, some actual reasons that it's important for the democratic process, that you should be able to speak truth to power and you can keep people who are in power, uh, you know, hold them to account uh, so that your speech cannot be impeded. You can say something about, you know, the president without fear of of uh, persecution so that uh, honesty is good. You know, th these are all reasons. The way this argument is framed, it's not giving any reasons. Here's another example. You can see what I uh, was missing on the previous slide there. Ghosts are real. That's your argument, right? Okay. Because, okay, you're going to give me proof ghosts are real? Because I have seen one. All right. Well, this is a little bit different. It's not just repeating that ghosts are real. Now you are giving evidence that can't be proven. You are relying on this personal experience, and it calls your personal experience into question. So it begs the question, how do you know that what you saw was actually a ghost? That's not proof. You're just saying it's, it's kind of like uh, asserting something is real by saying uh, you have evidence, but then you don't really have the evidence. It's more like uh, just trust me, right? Uh, so the different examples of begging the question. Now, circular reasoning is very similar to begging the question, circular reasoning. Sometimes begging the question gets confused with circular reasoning because begging the question is uh, often just about repeating itself, like repeating, um, restating the claim in a different way and pretending it's evidence. Well, circular reasoning is it's similar because it repeats an idea rather than giving a valid reason. And, and some people might see this as the, as the same thing. But in this case, it's a premise that is also used as the conclusion. So Martha is a good supervisor because she supervises personnel effectively. Well, I mean, that's it's like when you look up a word in the dictionary and you find that the definition just uses a form of the same word. Like um, if, you, uh, uh, if you look up the word supervisor and it says uh, someone who supervises and you're like, I don't know what supervise means, right? It's kind of circular. It's pointless. And they just used the word again. They just kind of, uh, it's, it's like begging the question because it, it's repeating uh, its claim. A publication is uh, pornographic only if it contains pornography. Okay. Well, how do I know if it's pornographic? Oh, the idea is, well, I guess you'll know. Uh, this doesn't tell us what it is. It just says the word again, right? The politician was truthful because he told us he always tells the truth. Well, that doesn't, <laughs> it, Again, here, it begs the question, how do you know he was being truthful when he told you he always tells the truth, right? It would be like Trump saying, I'm the best president because I'm so good at presidenting. Uh, that's not really a word, but I could imagine him saying it. So that's not proof that you're a good president. You're just saying that you're a good president again. You're saying, I'm good. I'm a good president because I'm good at being the president. Well, that, that, that's not giving any evidence. You're just kind of going in circles, restating yourself. Uh, <clears throat> a straw man argument. Now, a straw man argument 
Uh, it's, it's named after like a scarecrow. It gives false characteristics to an argument and then it attacks those false characteristics. So instead of dealing with a real argument, it's like there's a real person who's making an argument to you. Instead of actually dealing with them and what they're saying, you build a fake scarecrow person and you pretend it's the real person and you pretend that's the person you're arguing against because it's easier to argue against the straw man than it is to argue against the real man well how do you build a straw man you you oversimplify their arguments you give false characteristics to their arguments you misrepresent what they're saying right like this guy is pointing to the straw man saying uh, he probably wants to take your money well here Here's an example. An, a, a straw man argument will ignore the real argument and it will substitute a distorted or exaggerated, misrepresented, usually oversimplified version of that argument. So here, for example, uh, the school budget, a school lunch budget must be examined to cut out waste. And then this person says he wants to starve our children. Well, that's not what he's saying. Obviously, he's saying that we need to stop wasting money not that we need to starve kids, right? So misrepresenting what the other side says is a common straw man argument. You see this all the time with gun control arguments. Uh, people say, you know, oh, uh, gun rights activists, they just want everyone to, uh, uh, they just want to encourage mass shootings and, and they want everyone to shoot their guns in the air like it's the Wild West. When actually gun rights activists usually are talking about um, uh, constitutional right to bear arms uh, or the idea of uh, uh, criminals not following gun control laws. So really you would just be disarming uh, law abiding citizens. You know, they, they have actual points that, that you would be ignoring if you presented them that way. And then uh, gun, gun control activists, they get misrepresented as uh, saying, you know, we want to take away all guns and, you know, uh, but that's not what gun control activists really say. They don't say they want to take away all guns. They don't want to take away your, your shotgun and your handgun for home protection. They don't want to take away your hunting rival, rifle that's used for lawful you know, sports hunting. They want to take away uh, high-capacity magazines, military-style uh, uh, assault rifles, uh, AR-15s, things like that, things that are most commonly used in mass shootings, that there is usually not a, a good reason for uh, citizens to have and that tend to get in the hands of people who shouldn't be using them. And then we get school shootings and mass shootings every week, it seems like. So misrepresenting the other side, not only is it a, a false argument, it's it's misleading, and if someone sees through it, they're not going to find you to be a trustworthy uh, and and credible arguer. Uh, who are the people you're trying to convince in in an in an argument? Usually, you're trying to convince people who don't have the same opinion as you. You're not preaching to the choir. You're not trying to. Uh, persuade the people who already think the same as you, you're trying to persuade the people who think differently from you. And so those might be the people you are misrepresenting and oversimplifying their views. And so, of course, they're going to find you to be not convincing because you can't even get their opinions right. How can you, how can they be expected to change their opinions when you're not even uh, representing the opinions right? The straw man argument tries to prove that point, overstating, exaggerating, oversimplifying the opposing side. Like in a debate, this guy says, we need to raise taxes for certain reasons. And then the other guy says, this guy wants to bleed tax play taxpayers dry. Well, that's not what he was saying, probably. He was probably saying we need to increase taxes because we have to pay for our roads that are falling apart. And the other person says he just wants to make people poor. Well, I mean, that's not what he was saying. Okay, an ad hominem attack is another uh, Latin term. Ad hominem means to the man. Ad hominem is when you attack a person on personal grounds rather than like, like the straw man, you don't want to deal with their argument. Well, the ad hominem also, you don't want to deal with the real issue, the real argument, so you just attack the person that's making it. You don't make a straw man. You don't uh, oversimplify or, or misrepresent their views. Instead, you just kind of, uh, attack them for something that's unrelated to their views. 
something personal usually. Um, our president is kind of famous for, for ad hominem attacks. He calls people, you know, um, liberal whack jobs. And uh, he says that, you know, he calls people uh, stupid or crazy all the time on Twitter. Uh, calling someone crazy or, or uh, calling someone stupid or, you know, things like that, that's, that's an ad hominem attack. And it usually has no place in actual academic rhetoric or argumentation. <clears throat> uh, Trump has been attacked with ad hominem attacks as well. Like Trump eats fast food and he's out of shape. So how can he be an effective leader? There he is eating McDonald's. He likes to eat McDonald's and KFC on his plane. <clears throat> well, what does this have to do with him being an effective leader, whether he can be an effective leader? This is, this is an ad hominem attack. What, I mean, the fact that he enjoys French fries means he's not good at leading. You know, there are so many other better reasons why you could uh, impugn his, his ability to be an effective leader. Why would you choose to attack him for, for eating French fries? Now, some might argue that there is some good basis for an attack like this, like, uh, we don't want our president to, you know, have a heart attack and, and, and then, you know, we have to go and, and have the vice president become president. So in, in elections, sometimes this does come up. I guarantee you in the next uh, presidential election that you guys will see uh, <clears throat> as, as Trump runs for reelection, people will attack him for his age and his health. Um, if uh, like currently while I, while I filmed this video, uh, Joe Biden is 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 one of the front runners in the uh, the Democratic side. He will be attacked for his his age. He's in his late seventies, right? Should we should we uh, should we elect someone who's old? Because what if they don't uh, survive their full term as president? Uh, they won't be able to serve two terms. You know, uh, it does get brought up, and it seems unrelated to their ability to lead. But uh, some people would argue that you know it's. It is important, uh, but but really, uh, someone being out of shape has nothing to do with how well they can be a leader. Mr. Spock is not an effective second in command because he has ugly pointed ears. Uh, oh, ugly ears. Well, what does that have to do with his ability to be a second in command? Uh, Dr. Kierkegaard's books about plant genetics are worthless because she was caught shoplifting. Well, if someone has done great work on plant genetics. They're a scientist. They have come up with very uh, useful um, discoveries and everything like that. But in their personal life, they once did something wrong. We should be able to separate those things. <clears throat> For example, I like movies that Tom Cruise does. The, the Mission Impossible movies are, are pretty cool, right? I can enjoy them despite the fact that I disagree with a lot of what the Church of Scientology ju does. And, uh, you know, Tom Cruise is, uh, you know, kind of the, the face of Scientology. <clears throat> well, his personal life doesn't necessarily have much to do with whether or not the film is good. Uh, it's, it's making a personal attack and then claiming that the, it has some relevance to the, to the point that you're making. Again, like some other ones, it's almost like a, a distraction, and we'll see more that, that are like distractions in logical fallacies. Another logical fallacy is overgeneralization. That's where you draw a conclusion about an entire group or an entire topic uh, based on insufficient evidence. And stereotypes are overgeneralizations. Uh, you say, uh, I know several bald musicians. Therefore, bald men must be musically talented. This is kind of like a non sequitur. Uh, it is you're jumping to this. It's like you're jumping to conclusions when your evidence is not sufficient in order to prove it. Uh, every time I've been to Florida, the weather has been rainy. So therefore, it's always rainy in Florida. Well, I mean, you just happened to go when it was raining. So that's not proof that it's always raining there. Uh, my mother, my sister, my girlfriend diet all the time. Therefore, women are always on a diet. Well, maybe, maybe the women that in your life diet a lot, but that's not proof that all women do, right? So uh, insufficient evidence. I've seen this in student papers where students will, <clears throat> students will uh, try to um, 
say that they did their own survey and they'll say, I, I surveyed like seven people and uh, they all said this. Therefore, you know, 80% of people agree. Well, first of all, that kind of evidence is is fine if you get it from a reputable source, from a from an actual survey institute that does surveys according to practices that make them statistically significant. Uh, if you when you take statistics as a college course, you'll learn that you need for statistics to be relevant and significant, you need a a population that you draw information from that is of a sufficient size to where you can make the assumption that the the results you got in this population are probably similar to the overall results of the entire population of the country or, or planet or something like that. <clears throat> so you just asking seven people you know, that's, that's not going to be uh, valid grounds to make an assumption. Uh, those aren't valid statistics. Also, the they're usually randomly chosen, the population for for a, a valid survey. So if it's seven people you know, those aren't random random people. You uh, probably live in the same town. You might have the same beliefs, your friends, right? So maybe you have the same job or you go to the same school, right? So don't rely on evidence like that that you've collected yourself in a paper, uh, even even uh, trying to interview someone yourself, unless you get a, a good interview with someone who's actually an expert in their field or an authoritative source, like I had a student one time was talking about making the argument of what should happen uh, with police brutality, that uh, he didn't think that police should have to wear body cams. And for evidence, he interviewed a police officer. Um, well, first of all, a police officer that you know is not necessarily a recognized expert on this topic. Also, that they probably have a bias as as someone who whom it would uh, directly affect. So it, it wasn't a valid uh, a valid uh, person to be interviewing. So I I would steer away from things like that as well. <clears throat> post hoc reasoning, uh, or the black cat syndrome. This comes from the Latin phrase post hoc ergo propter hoc, which means after this, therefore, because of this. Um, after a black cat crosses my path, I failed my math test. Therefore, that cat caused me to fail my test. Uh, this is assuming that something caused something just because it happened afterward, when maybe there's no connection at all. Maybe it's coincidence, right? And it's this is often called mistaken coincidence for a cause, questionable cause, false cause. There's a lot of names for this. Superstition does this a lot, right? You break a mirror, you must have bad luck. Maybe that happened because someone broke a mirror and then they had bad luck afterward. And they're like, it must be because I broke that mirror, right? It must be because that cat crossed my path. You're looking out your window as you drive and you see a, a, a crow flying overhead. And then you get into a car accident and you say, oh, it was because that crow flew overhead. It was a, a bad omen. Uh, the, the crow caused me to get into a crash. Uh, probably not. There might be a correlation, a connection there. The connection being that you weren't watching the road. You were looking at the bird in the sky. You should have been watching where you were going. But it's not the cause. Right. This is very common when uh, you have super fans of, of sports teams who believe that they have to wear their certain jersey that they always wear or their team will lose. Uh, there's a kind of a superstitious connection there. Um, so an example, he was listening to rap music before robbing the bank. Therefore, rap music caused him to commit the crime. This is kind of a very common part of the reasoning of uh, uh, people that claim video games cause school shootings or violence, right? Well, these kids played video games like the Columbine school shooting a long time ago. This was an argument then. And it's kind of coming back now that people are trying to uh, blame violent video games for violence. Uh, they, used to blame, <clears throat> they used to blame violent rap music. They used to blame violent films in the 80s. The thing is, it doesn't take into account all of the people who watch those films or play those video games who never tried to harm anyone. Uh, so it's it's making this assumption that, oh, they played this video game, therefore the video game caused them to do what they did. Uh, and it's, and it's, it's post-hoc reasoning. <clears throat> False dichotomy. 
That's the either the either or fallacy. That's saying that you either have only you only have two choices, either this or that, and there's no other choice, right? Uh, it's like saying you're you're either with us or you're against us. Um, but most situations have more than two possible outcomes. Like you either support sending more troops to the Middle East or you are the enemy of America. Well, what if what if I don't want to send more troops because I love our country and I, I love our troops, right? That, that it's not only two two ways to look at things, right? <clears throat> Uh, if you don't drive this car, you might as well not, not drive at all. Well, what if I, what if I drove another car, right? Or the bus or something like that. Th those aren't the two choices, drive this car or nothing at all. Uh, you can either stay at your current job or you, you quit and you'll live in poverty and you'll be homeless. Well, what if, couldn't I find a better job or some other job or, you know, there's got to be some other option. So a red herring, like some other ones that I've said, like the, uh, the, the ad hominem and the straw man, a red herring kind of avoids the issue at hand and it, it brings up a, a distraction. It kind of takes it off topic because you don't want to deal with the actual topic that's being discussed. So you have, uh, it's, a red herring, it's called that because they used to use these red herrings, these smelly fish, when they would do uh, hunts. You may have seen hunts in, mu in movies in old uh, England. They'd be on horses and they would have hound dogs that are sniffing foxes, you know, the fox hunts, right? So if you were on the trail of a of a fox and you wanted to to get the win the hunt right then you would leave a smelly fish behind so that other hunters uh hounds could not catch the scent right so it throw hounds off the scent well uh a red herring is basically throwing people off track it's changing the subject uh trying to provide a a uh, a distraction to to draw attention away from the main issue shift focus aside politicians do this a lot so you're a vegetarian because you disagree with killing animals so how can you support abortion rights well so this is like changing the subject right you're not talking about vegetarianism anymore and killing animals now you're talking about human life now you're talking about abortion uh debate right it seems to be a different topic I work 60 hours a week to support my family and I pay my taxes. You shouldn't arrest me just because I drove a little drunk, right? Well, okay. That's good for you that you work a lot. I'm glad you support your family. Uh, it's great that you pay your taxes. What does that have to do with the fact that you've been caught drunk driving? Uh, let, let's not try to pretend that that, that affects the situation at all. Uh, we can't worry about the environment. We're in the middle of a war. Well, so that's just a way to dodge the uh, some some question about the environment that someone brings up, right? Uh, why did your company dump, dump toxic chemicals in the river? You're not looking at the big picture. Our company helps citizens with jobs and charity drives. We even provide college scholarships for local students, right? Well, what is that's good that they give scholarships and uh, have charity drives. Uh, what does that have to do with the dumping the illegally dumping chemicals in a river? Uh, they have uh, they have tried to turn the narrative towards something that they find to be more make them look better, right? Uh, you're well. Let's look at what we do that's good instead of what we do that's bad. Well, that's a good way to distract from the actual question at hand, and they're dodging the question. And that's really what the red herring is all about: dodging a question. Appeal to the crowd. This is sometimes called the bandwagon fa fallacy. It has an, a Latin name like uh, most of the others, argumentum ad populum, uh, the bandwagon fallacy. It suggests that just because something is popular, it must be good or right, right? This is the idea of uh, uh, lemmings running off of a cliff. When, when a herd of lemmings, when a group of lemmings is these little animals, when they uh, start to run, they all act as a crowd and they all it's they do this kind of group think where they uh, whatever the group does they all do so if if uh, some of them run and jump off a cliff the all of the lemmings end up jumping off a cliff and dying uh, and it's where we get this phrase if everyone jumped off a cliff would you you've probably heard that you may be growing up your parents have said that to you 
right? If everyone jumped off a cliff, would you do it? Because, because you're saying, well, everyone's doing it, right? That's the bandwagon fallacy. Well, everyone's doing it. Well, that doesn't mean that it's a good thing to do, right? Millions of people believe in astrology, so it must be true in some way. Mm, not necessarily. It may be a, a false science, a pseudoscience that has a, a, a long history, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you can predict anything about someone's day-to-day -day life by looking at uh, the position of the stars when they were born. Uh, this gluten-free cupcake must be better for me because everyone says gluten-free is healthier. Well, uh, most, most nutritionists will tell you, most uh, medical uh, professionals will tell you that, yeah, gluten-free is very important for people with certain medical conditions like celiacs disease um who they th these are people who cannot cannot process gluten uh but for most other people who can process gluten and wheat uh you know it, it may not be the healthiest there may be some other carbohydrates that are better for you but you know there's there's nothing wrong with eating wheat for a lot of people so uh don't just jump on the bandwagon because everyone says gluten free is healthier it has been kind of exaggerated for a lot of people uh similar to the appeal to the crowd is the appeal to tradition uh just because you've always done it that way doesn't mean it's not incredibly stupid here's an idea uh, here's a picture of the running of the bulls uh you know yeah we've always had the running of the bulls this is a time honored tradition well it seems kind of stupid to run in front of some bulls and you might get gored and people get killed doing it. So this argument says something is good uh, just because it is how it's always been done. Something is correct. This is the best way to do it because it's our tradition. It's the way it's always been done. We should continue doing things as the way they've been done in the past. Uh, we shouldn't challenge time on honored traditions or customs. Basically, don't rock the boat. Don't change the status quo. It's, uh, this plays on fear a lot of times. Who knows what could happen if we change things, right? Uh, we're afraid of change, so we're not going to try to change things. Well, uh, here, here's an example. Of course, you have to play Here Comes the Bride at your wedding because that, that's always been the song that it gets played. Well, that doesn't mean you have to play it just because Here Comes the Bride is uh, what usually gets played. My wife didn't play here comes the bride at our wedding instead she played uh she played the theme song of star trek the next generation when she walked down the aisle it's uh it's it's very very different uh tradition is not always good that's the other thing right women have never voted why change tradition well we're pretty glad that they changed that tradition and women can vote just like we're pretty glad they changed the tradition that uh, african americans could be enslaved and and used as uh, as uh, as labor for free right uh there are lots of things that were tradition and they were terrible right so it's a good thing that they have been changed change is good in a lot of time a lot of places um so there are lots of logical fallacies. I'll probably be doing an activity in class where we identify logical fallacies in commercials, uh, and then we'll identify logical fallacies uh, in action, in, in, in arguments, uh, and I'll give you a list of them. So we'll be talking more about logical fallacies, and I want you to be uh, trying to identify them uh, earlier in everything we read in all of our articles identify what uh, in your upcoming article by Stephen March and after that uh, we'll have um, articles by Sherry Turkle uh, and uh, uh, someone with the last name Tufeki uh, do you see how how are they appealing to their audiences and then what logical fallacies are they using right so if you skip to the end here and you're looking for the secret password I I already gave it earlier in the uh, in the presentation so you should be watching the whole presentation have a good day